And thank you, Karen. One thing that I've seen is when you bring people uh, in from outside of any scientific endeavor or any uh, business, um, they look at things with a different point of view than those who uh, have been in it for a long time. So it's probably a, a good thing, I would guess, to uh, bring in outsiders to take a look at the, uh, your industry. Um, one of the benefits of having jet lag when I come here is I'm up very early in the morning going over scientific papers. And uh, those of you, anybody, anybody here follow BL? Oh, God. BL's the informed discussion group of beekeeping. It's a chat group, and uh, yeah, if you want to keep up on what's happening with beekeeping and bee science and vigorous debate about that, at a level um, the general public can understand, uh, BL is, is very good. You can Google it and, and, and do it. So we've been having, a, I posted a couple of posts on uh, debating another uh, researcher on analysis of uh, one of the recent papers out of uh, Science Magazine on, uh, an, it was an anti-neonic uh, paper that was very shoddy and we're debating that. And another one on uh, genetic engineering and precision uh, breeding for plants, and I mentioned what the uh, potential here. So anyway, that'd be something you could look at. Okay, Varroa. Uh, let me tell you this. I, I've been here to New Zealand a few times in, uh, over the last several years, and every time it's like deja vu. Uh, I hear words that you guys are using in industry that we had used 10, 15 years previously that have long been forgotten because we've had Varroa for longer than you have. And every country pretty much goes through the, the same uh, progression of dealing with Varroa and, and the evolution of, of mites and viruses and stuff. So um, I'm going to try to give you a little glimpse into the future here. Um, it used to be easy, uh, beekeeping, very, very easy. You just get, put some bees in a box and you walk away from them and you harvest honey from time to time. There was you know, nothing else, else involved. And then this new parasite jumped hosts. Oh, God, I should ask you a question right now. There was a single mutation in one female mite, and the clonal population of that single mutated mite started the worldwide varroa epidemic. I'm always surprised that every single beekeeper can't describe to me what that mutation was, and most bee researchers can't say that. I would think that that'd be the first thing you look for. What was it that changed? I'm not going to tell you right now, though. <laughs> I don't have time. Uh, anyway, the mite came, colony started dying, and we said, oh, God, we got to do something. When you have a new a uh, pest, a new pathogen. There's what's called integrated pest man management. There's this pyramid of progression of the steps that you can take. Um, and generally, you start, the, you start at the bottom. Traditionally, before we had modern chemistry, you start with cultural methods. You look for other cultivars, like you're doing right now with the, um, the myrtle rust. You look for plants that survive um, despite having the myrtle rust, and you, you breed from them. You change your culture. You move your livestock to a different sort of pasture, or you plant in a different kind of environment, or you water the plants differently. Those are things that people have done forever in agriculture. The next thing is to go up, to the next step up to uh, physical and mechanical, biotechnical. Um, well, let me first say, on Varroa, this is what South Africa did. They did nothing. They let nature take its course. Uh, if you read the, uh, the South African bee journals, or the South African conferences, national conferences, Varroa is never mentioned. They have Varroa. They keep bees commercially. They never talk about Varroa at all. That should tell you something right there. If you just step aside and let nature can take its course. The next thing is the mechanical or biotechnical. So these would be things where you're splitting your hives or you're creating brood breaks. This has been used a lot in Europe and by a lot of the treatment-free beekeepers trying to figure out ways to do it. Um, for commercial, it's, it's usually pretty onerous to do that. And then finally, you start moving up to to uh, the biopesticides. So that would be something like taking uh, plant extracts. That'd be formic acid, that'd be thymol, something like that that you could use there. That's very common also in traditional uh, uh, pest control, uh, spraying chili leaves, or, uh, chili extract, or garlic on your, on your plants. That would be using biopesticides. And then since World War II, we've had the option of synthetic chemicals. Um, so that's a brand new option. So when Varroa arrives in most countries, we just skip right to the top. We just bypass all the other steps entirely. We come up with these silver bullets. You stick a plastic strip into your beehive, and everything is all better again. It's just amazing. There was a, a bee researcher in Oregon years ago who stood up in front of an audience and said, God, you know, Varroa is probably the best thing that ever happened to the commercial beekeeping industry. It eliminated all the competition from all those feral bees, and eliminated all the lousy beekeepers, and only those who are successful are surviving, and beekeeping is really easy again. What, what he didn't <laughs> realize is the concept of evolution. So with, with the, and I'll get back to that, with the, um, the synthetic miticides, it was really simple. You put this, this strip into your hive once, once a year, 
the, you cover the bottom board with dead mites. It's very gratifying to see all those thousands of dead mites. And, uh, and repeat the process again. It worked for you guys up till fairly recently. When I was here several years ago, a lot of uh, commercial uh, beekeepers were still using, using this. When they saw mites walking all over the backs of their bees, they said, oh, maybe I should think about putting in a miticide strip. And th you can manage that, that. This is the problem. I predict that things are going to change. And they have changed in every other country. And what happens is you find out that you can no longer let your mites get to that kind of level. Or that you can't count on just putting those treatments in once every fall and, and, and uh, them being effective. And the, the point is, is that life never stands still. Life always is evolving and changing. You're dealing with a biological system right here, and it's going to change. So that miticide strip doesn't change. That's a fixed chemical in a changing world. And what happens is evolution changed two main things uh, with Varroa and bees. So let's go for the first one. It's the bee virus dynamics. Prior to Varroa, the only way that bees generally would get a virus is the oral fecal route. They would eat it through their mouth and would have to uh, get through their gut cells to infect their body. Let's all do a quick experiment with me, okay? I want everybody to breathe out and take one deep breath. Okay, ready? They're out, and then in. Not everybody did that. Everybody, okay? We're all doing an experiment. Out, and in. Very good. Now, every single person in this room has inhaled vir virions, fungal spores, and bacterial spores enough to kill you. If those spores germinate in your lungs and find that growth medium and start growing, you will all be dead. Now, I've done this experiment before, and most participants do not die, so don't worry about it right now. The, but the, the reason that you don't die is because you have an immune system that's used to putting food into the holes in your body, into your mouth, and into your, into your nose. And those membranes inside have very robust immune systems that are, are, have dealt for millions of years with all those uh, pathogens that come in that want to eat you from the inside out. And that's the way bees were. It was very difficult to infect a bee with a virus by feeding it through the mouth. Try it sometime. I've done it in lab tests. It's hard to infect bees with a, with a virus by mouth. When Bro came, it changed everything. Now suddenly, we had a vector that injected those virions directly into the bloodstream of the bees. The bees were caught flat-footed. They had no idea what to do. Their immune system had never had this kind of insult of having these viruses injected right into their bloodstream. And that started a huge problem here. The viruses now can start evolving. And these RNA viruses evolve very, very quickly. They have an extremely high genetic recombination rate and high mutation rate <coughs> and, and hybridization rate. And they start taking advantage of this new vector, this Varroa vector. And nobody really realized it. Dr. Stephen Martin was the first one to do it. And he figured out it's not the Varroa that's killing the hives. It's the viruses. The deformed wings aren't from bees sucking on the, or burrow sucking on the wing pads. That's from a virus. Brilliant researcher. Stephen has been fantastic. He could not get the paper published. No publisher would believe it. No, he couldn't get it through peer review. He tried for years and finally got it published in this, in this paper right here. And that's been the model ever since then of this virus collapse, typically either from the acute uh, paralysis viruses or um, deformed wing virus, uh, which have become our two main viruses. And these viruses have always been around. Bees have always had deformed wing virus. They used to get occasionally die from deformed wing virus, but it was so rare that nobody ever paid attention to it until Varroa showed up. <coughs> and now, once those viruses, the deformed wing virus start to evolve, the once a year treatment would no longer do the trick. We, we watched, I could see in my own hives the change that we, instead of seeing bees with deformed wings, we just started seeing the pupae started dying and not seeing so many deformed wings. And you could just, if you're a biologist, I mean, to me, as a beekeeper, it was a pain in the butt. As a biologist, it was fascinating to watch evolution in action happening within my own beehives. So Stephen Martin, some years later, said, wow, I'd like to really look into this virus evolution. So he went to Hawaii. Now, if you're a researcher, always try to choose a research project that gets you to Hawaii or Tahiti or someplace like that. And somebody will pay you to stay there. And what he did is he looked at the Hawaiian islands and he realized that the Varroa had invaded the different islands for different amounts of time, anywhere from zero years up to three years. Then he looked in his colonies and he looked for, man, I guess I, can I point here? Oh, I can point right here, fantastic. Okay, so at zero years, so here's zero years, what a slow pointer. Um, at zero years, only a few colonies showed any deformed wing virus. 
And deformed wing virus is a natural insect virus. It's found in ants and wasps and other pollinators. And it exists in this cloud of quasi-species, okay? All different forms of deformed wing virus. And what happened, as you look at the timeline from zero years up to three years, as deformed wing virus evolved, it started becoming more and more prevalent until every single hive had it in it. And it, natural selection selected from this cloud of different variants of deformed wing virus down to just a few, the most successful, the few, until there's only one virulent form outcompeting all other forms. And I invite you guys to watch this biological process take place in New Zealand, <laughs> as it surely is doing right now. The point is, <laughs> you guys can't stand still, because I, I guarantee you, Varroa is not going to stand still, and those viruses are not going to stand still. They are busy evolving. Now, in nature, nature is self-limiting on this. When a new pathogen comes in, it just wipes out the host, so the host is spread so far apart that the pathogen can't spread from host to host, in our case, from hive to hive. So when Varroa first comes through and the, with the virus, it knocks out like 95, 99% of all the uh, hives of bees in a natural environment, and they're so spread apart that the mites can't transmit from one hive to the other, and the viruses can't transmit from one hive to the other. So that's self-limiting. The virulent forms kill the host too fast. And then slowly the host, the honeybee, can start to evolve resistance. And as it does, then it can repopulate the habitat and start to get a greater population density with the resistant forms to that virus. You all with me? Understand how, that, how this works? So humans, of course, step into the picture, and we just keep restocking the host and keep increasing the amount of virus transmission. And since the Monica <laughs> gold rush that's happening right here, you're just doing this like 10 times more. You're just packing the host so close that you have now entered in a, into a breeding program for the most virulent forms of virus that can exist. You're doing a fantastic job, and I'm sure you'll start seeing results pretty soon. What you've got to realize is it's a community issue. Everything you do with your bees affects your neighbors because of this drifting of mites between hives. And I'll talk about that this afternoon. <coughs> And when you start packing hosts together tightly, you will always favor the evolution of the most virulent, virulent forms of every parasite. So just keep that in mind. Now what happens is, all these parasites learn to fight the immune systems of their hosts. So they put in immune suppressors. So the viruses, the, w typically when a, when a virus or nosema gets into a gut cell in the bee, the first thing the gut cell does is sacrifice itself. It's called apoptosis. If they can sacrifice itself and break down before the virus or the nodema can replicate, then the, the, the pathogen can never get a foothold in the host. So of course, viruses and nosema code for proteins that suppress the natural apoptosis so the gut cells don't kill themselves so they can then um, uh, keep reproducing, the parasite can. The problem with that is they work together. If any one of those parasites suppresses that apoptosis, then any other parasite can also then start multiplying in that gut cell. And that's what's happening in our bees these days. And now you, I, you lucky guys, you now have Nazima cermani too. And it does a really good job of suppressing gut apoptosis. It opens the door for those viruses. And in that suppressed immune system of those bees then, we start seeing this, called, we call it P PMS, or parasitic mite syndrome, where your colonies look like they're sick from every disease known. Very easy to, co to confuse with American fowl brood or European fowl brood if you're not used to it. Are you guys seeing much of this parasitic mite syndrome yet? Yes, yes or no? Yes, okay, it's, it's not, pretty, not a pretty sight. And for you beginning beekeepers, it's often difficult to, to diagnose and, and um, it, will, it does not rope like American fowl brood. And there's a number of symptoms and, and Mark's done a very good job, good one, of, of showing those symptoms. So don't get this confused with American uh, fowl brood. So what we're talking about here, when we're talking about varroa management, a colony of bees can have a mite on every single bee and still thrive. It's not varroa that's the problem, it's the viruses that are the problem. And I was down recently consulting on a Zika virus project with mosquitoes down in Brazil. If you're trying to fight a virus, you just deal with the parasite, with the mosquitoes, and that m controls the transmission of the virus, and you don't have to worry about the virus. So you guys are dealing not with varroa, you're dealing with viruses, and what you need to do is to control the vector. Does that make sense to you? You're not very loud in your answers, guy. <laughs> okay. A second problem occurred, and that's the silver bullets, which were so wonderful and magical. 
But like anything that's just too good to be true, it was too good to be true. So there are pros, there are, there are cons. One is that there are wide margin of safety. When Fluvalnik came, first came out, it had a margin of safety. It, it took 1,500 times as much to kill a bee as it did to kill a vi uh, the, uh, varroa mite. Um, so, so the operators could just throw it into the hive and didn't have to worry about, about anything, okay? That was really easy. You had the extended release formulation. It was great. The problem is you couldn't put any miticide in the hive that was water soluble because it would get into the honey, which means instead of having hydrophilic, water loving miticides, you had to have lipophilic or fat or wax loving ones. And these synthetic miticides just go straight into the beeswax. And to our chagrin, we found out not only do they go into the beeswax, but they just stay in there forever. And they just build up over and over, year ap application after application. And they just keep putting selective pressure on the mites to develop resistance to, to them. The other problem is they only have a single mode of action. They work at the neurons of the, uh, uh, for nerve transmission. And they target specific proteins. And when you apply them, you will have a few mites with different kinds of either mutations or different alleles for those genes, for those receptor sites, and you just weed out all the susceptible ones, and the only ones that survive are the ones that are non-susceptible, and they become your breeding popula population. Now, normally in nature, in most insect species where you have diploid males and females, those mutations get weeded out in subsequent matings. But Perot has got a trick up its sleeve. It has what's called incestuous matings. The male mites mate with their sisters, and the male mites are haploid. They only have one set of chromosomes. And what that means is they can evolve at a much faster rate than can insects, the, the mites. Not only that, the reproductive cycle of the varroa mite is about 17 days. The reproductive cycle of the, of the bee is one year. So the varroa is going to evolve much, much more quickly than the bees are. So, um, the synthetic, synthetic miticides, they were doomed from the start. They were stopgap measures. I call them fly swatters and band-aids. You're dealing with a major problem with fly swatters and band-aids when you really need to be looking at the problem, more at the root of the problem. And what we do is we enter the resistance treadmill where you, you start off with the, the pest is causing a problem. You're looking at short-term uh, 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 fix for that. Start uh, putting in the, the miticide. It starts to fail, so you start increasing the doses, you start increasing the number of times a year you, you, you use it, and then you've entered the selective breeding program for resistance, and you wind up with, with resistant pests. So you switch to a new pesticide, and you just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. That's called the pesticide treadmill. And I saw this happening in the United States, and after the second pesticide, I decided to step off that uh, treadmill myself back in 2002. And this was the, the failure rate in, in the U.S. What I, I, I color-coded these bars, so where they fade out to white, that means they stopped working in the U.S. And then if you remove that selective pressure from the, from the, from the mites, they, the, you can again perhaps use those pesticides because the mites, if there's a, a, a cost to the mite to develop resistance, if you take away that pesticide application, then the, the non-resistant mites are more fit and they will start to, to, to come back. So some of these you could use again if you wanted to. And, and, and I went through the fl fluvalinate uh, failure. I went through the kumafos failure. Actually, I, didn't try, I tried it, but <laughs> do you realize that the check mite strips, then LD50 is the lethal dose for 50% of the population. The LD50 for an adult human being, 155 pound human being, would be two kumafos strips, two check mite strips. So if you put two strips, like what you would put in your hive, and put them in a blender and you ate them, you have a 50% chance of killing yourself. And I said, you know, that's really not why I got into beekeeping. To, <laughs> to test, determine what my LD50 was for Kumafos. Um, so I, I, got, I, I got off that uh, treadmill. And what's happening now is as our miticides are failing, this is uh, just a recent headline that uh, beekeepers report catastrophic loss in annual nationwide government survey. So any agency that wants to get more public funding will always do headlines like this, whether they're true or not. But there, there are problems. Every researcher is looking for funding. We'll always talk about the decline of the bees and all that. And as we saw yesterday, no, the numbers of hives are going up. There's no decline of honeybees. But it is harder to keep them alive. But everything is marketing. Pesticide companies market. Fund environmental groups market. Um, uh, government uh, people market to say how important they are and how much they deserve more money being thrown at them. Everybody does that. Just, just, just understand, uh, understand that. So here's the, here's the opportunity. You guys actually have the chance to learn from our mistakes. 
Okay, there's a lot of countries that have a head start on you. Here's the progression of how Varroa showed up throughout the, the world. Uh, you guys were probably late in the game, and Australia is eagerly awaiting to join this, uh, this game. <laughs> um, and I, I spoke, I've spoken a number of times in Australia, and I, I've told them, if you guys can just keep the damn mite out of the borders until we can breed mite-resistant bees, when it finally arrives, then you can just import resistant bees, and you won't even have to go through all the, the, the terrible problems that we have gone, gone through, making beekeeping so, so much more difficult. So what I'm seeing is, <coughs> across the world, we're entering a new era of varroa management because the synthetic mitocytes are failing across the world. If you go to uh, South America, if you go to Central Europe, if you go to the US, beekeepers there are all different than, than New Zealand beekeepers. You guys follow the rules. It's like, that's such a weird thing for me to see. Um, in every other country, beekeepers just dump every illegal mitocyte imaginable into their hives. Um, the uh, Amitraz has uh, the, the Agriculture farms have been, been uh, illegal in the U.S. for a couple of years. And beekeepers import it from Australia and from Mexico and bring in this. Now they're smugglers of illegal mitocytes. And the same thing in Europe, same thing in South America. Um, no matter what the government says on regulations, in most countries, the beekeepers just ignore all those laws and start uh, putting it in. And they just fight to the end and they keep ramping up the doses higher and higher. And it starts to go they, uh, until they no longer work at all. <coughs> so I mentioned this book yesterday. <coughs> um, who moved my cheese? So let's take a look at, at, at the, the implications of this book or the recommendations of this book. So the first thing, anticipate that there's going to be a change. I was told by the manufacturer of uh, Apivar strips um, uh, a year before he was going to remove this product from the market that he was going to take it off, but I was un he said, you can't tell anybody this. So when I get my PowerPoints, I made this slide up with my son. This is the off-label formulation tactic used throughout, throughout the world and, and how everybody just loved it. And I said, what are you going to do? I said, hypothetically, if this happens. Well, I knew it was going to happen, <laughs> but I couldn't say so. What are you going to do? What's your plan B? Have you got your plan B all worked out? Or are you going to be scrambling? What happened a few years ago was tactic was unavailable for a few months one summer, and many commercial beekeepers had no idea what to do, and they just crashed their operations. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of bees just collapsed because they didn't have a plan B in place. I suggest you guys all have a plan B in place when you put your strips in and nothing happens that you know what to do, where to go for from there. The second thing the book says is to monitor change. Throughout the world, Amitraz is has failed. Sometimes it is a few as six years. Sometimes it goes on for some time, but it's failing all over the world. I was at a recent beekeepers meeting, queen breeders meeting in uh, Northern California, and <clears throat> used to be one application a year would do it. Now they're doing six to ten applications a year to get the same result. Okay, biologically that's telling you, <laughs> get ready, something's going to change. The other thing, our residues are building up in our honey, so um, we're finding out U.S. honey is no longer clean honey, cleaner than Nestle than Chinese honey. We got residues of, of these things in there. So th the point is, time's running out. Get, I'm giving you guys a heads up right now. So you can cross your fingers, hope it lasts for a while longer, but in the meantime, you have a chance to, to prepare. <coughs> the last thing the book says is to adapt to change quickly. So I'm going to give you some options, and I'll go down this list one at a time in my remaining time right now. First thing, pray for new mitocides. Okay, some salvation. Well, the bad news is there's very few products in the pipeline. The major pesticide companies don't have any magic bullets coming, okay? So your prayers will probably go unanswered on that one. <coughs> you can ramp up your applications of Amitraz. So here's my mite model. This would be, I, I made it up for New Zealand climate right here and showing uh, how the, uh, your mite progression will build up and your alcohol wash through the course of your, to your colonies crash. So now I've plugged in two 98% efficacy treatments of Amitraz. And you can look here, on here, I always show the starting mite level right here and the ending mite level right here. So two treatments, that knocks the mites out entirely. You got no, no problem. But what if efficacy only drops to, drops to only 90% kill instead of 98% kill? Now you start with 100 mites and you enter the next season with a starting count of 287 mites. That's non-sustainable. If you start with more at the end, have more at the end than the beginning, that's non-sustainable. And then let's drop that efficacy to only 70%. 
Oh, wow, now you're ending with over a thousand mites. In most countries, you cannot overwinter a hive with over a thousand mites. It's too many mites once your viruses uh, get going. So what you do, well, I'll just start doing more treatments. So let's do five treatments a year at 70%, and you're pretty close. You're ending up with 126 mites, but no longer, now not only are you a beekeeper, you're also a varroa breeder. And you are doing a very good job of a selective breeding program for varroa mites that are resistant to whatever chemical you are breeding for resistance for. Another one, set up your mite monitor, step up mite monitoring. Move right up here. Look at monitoring. I asked the beekeepers here about monitoring, and you guys, it's like a joke to me. Um, yes, if you're going to be a beekeeper alive in most of the world, you've got to monitor your, your mite levels. Um, this is the, the uh, um, uh, ether roll. Um, was commonly, still commonly used by a lot of beekeepers. It's really inaccurate. I would not recommend that. The best is the alcohol swirl. Not the alcohol shake, but the alcohol swirl. The mites drop straight down. Quick and very good. I will go over that in some detail um, this afternoon and you know, even greater detail tomorrow for any commercial operators here who want to really know how to, how to do it quickly. And then you want to monitor um, throughout the, the season, especially in the fall if you have other beekeepers around you because you're going to get this mite load from the mites drifting in. And here's an example. We uh, sampled 200 hives uh, last year. Uh, mite washes in, a, in our breeding program. I'm doing 1,000 hives, mite washes. I'm um, a little better than halfway through this last week, and I'll finish some next week when I, when I get home. Um, and what we found is most of those hives, the mite levels, were way down here, and they're really the safe level. These guys are all, mites are, are well controlled, but you got these mite bombs here full of viruses, and, oh, I can show that tonight, this afternoon, how they dr drift into your other hives. So you want to Mark those high mite hives, deal with them, monitor those ones. Monitoring the low mite hives doesn't really tell you anything, because these are the ones that are going to be the problem for you and your, your neighbors. You can also apply miticides more effectively. Um, proactively is the main thing, with, especially with amitraz, okay, to get going um, before the mite levels get up there. Okay, I'm going to start blasting here. Uh, rotate your treatments. This has long been known. Use several treatments. The more, the better in rotation, so it makes it harder for the mites to evolve resistance. <laughs> Understand the limitations of each treatment. This is all on my website if you look on my first year of beekeeping, uh, these, these graphs right here. You have some biotechnical options, making splits. You split a hive three ways. You start with one-third the mite count per hive. Using octalic or apovar early on. This is on my website showing, and I'll talk about it this afternoon, uh, treating your nukes, something similar to uh, or, what? Mark Goodwin was talking about yesterday. This is very effective. We've done this for 15 years. I'll show this this afternoon, how you can completely, those of you who don't want to use synthetic miticides, one simple split each spring and a few pennies worth of oxalic acid. You can be essentially mite-free every spring on your colonies. Very, very simple. Uh, Italy and France, where they've blown through all, all their miticides, they're caging their queens, even commercially, for an uh, induced brood break during the summer, and then using oxalic acid. You can use the essential oils, the organic acids. Yeah. I got how much more time? Oh, oh, then I can slow down. <laughs> Where was I? Okay. Okay. This, this, this one's interesting. I'll talk about some of this this afternoon also. On, uh, I'll, I'll go into much more detail on these varroa management options. And, and they can fit whatever your philosophy is. If you are an adamant, I'm not going to put a, a, a synthetic miticide in my hive if it kills, you know, if, if you threaten to kill me. There's plenty of ways to do that. You don't need to do that. If you want to use synthetics, work them in there. I don't put value judgments on things. So lots of beekeepers put strong value judgments on things. So I'm, I'm impartial to all these things. What I want to see is what works. As long as it doesn't hurt the environment or hurt the beekeeper, I'm, I'm fine with it. Okay? So these induced brood breaks have all kinds of problems, especially for your small-scale beekeepers who have the time to actually find, if you can find the queen in the hive, that gives you all kinds of options for doing mite control very cheaply and very organically. Okay, so here's the, the biomiticides. These are generally plant-derived uh, products, and there may be some animal-derived products that they do some like extracts from, from the mites or something like that, um, people working on this. Um, again, these are stopgap measures until we can breed for resistant bees. So this is good for that transition from where you're at now, the synthetic mite on sides, to where you're going to be in the future, where you, we will all have resistant uh, bees that deal with the mites. So we have the essential oils. First thing I want to tell you, 
humans love essential oils. You love the smell of essential oils. You love taking a bath with these smells. You love rubbing it on your neck and stuff. But you should ask yourself the question, why do plants produce essential oils? To kill or repel insects. Honeybees are insects. Honeybees do not share your enthusiasm for essential oils, okay? So all of you out there have been on the internet thinking about, oh, all these different essential oil concoctions that you can throw into your hive, the bees hate them, <laughs> okay? I'm speaking for the bees right now. They hate them. Now, of all the essential oils tested, and they've been very well tested, the only one that consistently gives good results is thymol, and they hate thymol. But if you put thymol in the hive for a 20-day dose, continuous dose, and the bees move it throughout the hive, it's very effective at controlling varroa mites. You can get 90 plus percent kill, and, um, and then the, the colony rebounds quickly. So it's a, a matter of timing. You wouldn't want to use it in the spring when they're building up, but you can use it after the flow uh, later in summer. And we use it very effect effectively, and we use it in very hot weather uh, too. Um, then I'll go through the organic acids. So this is Dr. Methat Nasser. He's a very successful apiculturist up in um, uh, on, not Ontario, Alberta, Canada. Came from California and, and a good friend. Um, years ago, he, he said a couple of a quotes that were really good. He said, the synthetic miticides are smart chemicals for dumb beekeepers. They've already figured out that you have this big margin of safety. And, and he said, even the first formulation of Fuvan, uh, the apistan strips, were 12 times stronger than they needed to be because the manufacturer wanted to make sure that you got a good mite kill. But you could have got, with one twelfth of the strip, you got an equal mite kill. So they already, when they first came out with it, already shot us in the foot by reducing the, the expected lifespan of that, of that treatment. Now, opposed to these smart chemicals for dumb beekeepers, he says the natural miticides are dumb chemicals for smart beekeepers. Instead of that margin of safety of, of 500 or 1,000 to 1, you have a margin of safety of 2 or maybe 3, which means that if you put in double the dose of one of these natural miticides, you're likely to hurt your bees, which means you actually have to follow the directions. You actually have to measure. You can't just take a scoop of it. You have to actually weigh it or take a, a careful measured dose. So if you're a smart beekeeper, you can use these. If you're a dumb beekeeper, you might as well just leave the room right now because uh, the rest is not going to help you, okay? Um, so here's, here's some of your options. The, the formic acid. Formic acid is, is an incredible miticide, and it's, the beauty of it is it does two things. It penetrates the cappings, and it can actually kill the mites under the cappings. It's the only miticide that does that, and it, like, cleans up the hive. I don't know what it does. Mark Goodwin and I were talking about yesterday what the effect is, but, it, like, it rejuvenates the hive. It breaks up, like, a disease transmission cycle in the boot or something. But it works great, and it works very, very quickly. You can do a six-hour overnight flash and eliminate the mites from your hive. It does have, let me see if I have it here. Okay, it does have some downsides, especially with temperature and effect on queen and dose in queens. I'll talk about that more this afternoon. Thymol. Um, the best form I've found is the um, uh, Apigard gel. Is that registered in New Zealand? It, it, it was the last time I was here. Okay. And is it? Oh. Mark, Mark, are you here, Goodwin? <laughs> Mark, Mark was, uh, Mark and I are, are friends, but he stood up in front of the stage here in New Zealand, and he said, oh, Randy, we tried that, Ipigard. it doesn't work in New Zealand. And I said, Mark, that's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard a scientist say in front of an audience, <laughs> that it doesn't work in New Zealand, it works in every other country on Earth, and you're saying in New Zealand it doesn't work? And I said, it means you haven't learned how to apply it. So I can say that because I was friend, a friend of his. <laughs> um, and yes, so the beekeepers, a uh, uh, number of beekeepers in New Zealand are learning how to apply this. And when I came back on a visit, uh, God, two years later, they were <laughs> way over applying it. Um, but anyway, it's a trial and error. It's a learning curve. You guys are going to make all kinds of mistakes. But yeah, you can, make, you can make this work just fine. We're very happy with it. The hops beta acids, uh, the hop guard too, I don't think that's registered here yet. This would be very promising. This, this tastes like Guinness, Guinness stout on steroids. It's just really, really bitter. Totally natural, totally organic. Um, the manufacturer is sending me some of the raw formulation. I talked to them and I said, you know what, I, I like your product, but I don't like your application method. Let me see if I can uh, come up with some ideas for you. So I'll be uh, working with this one. So this may be something in your, in your future. And I, I would work to go ahead and get this registered, push for getting registration of this, this product in New Zealand. It doesn't contaminate the honey. Uh, this is one of the main ones we use is the oxalic acid dribble. Here we are applying it during our, in the late fall. Uh, when the colonies uh, 
go broodless or get as, as close to broodless as they get. We're kind of like you. We may or may not get a brood break uh, during the, the winter. And then the, the hot one now is oxalic vaporization. And uh, it started off these little um, oxo, what were they called? The little, uh, I can't remember the name. The little short vaporizer, a little pan about this long, real discreet, you stick it in there. And then the Americans got a hold of it and um, I think it's a case of uh, penis compensation or something because these vaporizers keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? Pretty soon you have a four-wheel drive vaporizer. You can come up and just vaporize the whole yard at one time. The, the problem is you have to wear a respirator. You have to wear protective gear. And if anybody's downwind, you can hurt them seriously. So um, we personally, in our operation, just due to operator safety, haven't used this. But it's very, very promising. It's, it's actually got advantages over the oxalic uh, dribble. Um, the other thing is it's... Uh, and I'll show you on the model this afternoon, um, it's not as efficacious as you would hope when there's any kind of brood in the hive. You're going you're to kill maybe 45% uh, of the mites in the hive with, a, with a, uh, a vaporization. You'd have to repeat it every four days for several times to get very good efficacy. Anybody in here using oxalic acid vaporization? Okay, good. So look at those people with their hands up. Learn from their mistakes, okay? And they will make mistakes, I will guarantee you. That's part of this whole beekeeping thing is, guys, don't be afraid to make some mistakes out there, okay? And learn from it. And the other thing is, who said it yesterday? David uh, said it. I have this new formulation I'm testing. I published about uh, extended release oxalic acid. Well, this one right here. <laughs> A couple of months later, I get, started getting emails from U.S. commercial beekeepers. Yeah, Randy, we applied it to 5,000 hives this uh, spring <laughs> to try it for the first time. <laughs> God, you got it. 5,000 hives for an experimental treatment? I said, no, that, that's, that's not wise. Um, to, I, I would, if you're going to experiment, <laughs> try things on a smaller number of hives to, to start with. Okay, then the ultimate fix. We all know what this is. And that's to get bees that do the job themselves. Hand the job of dealing with the mite away from us and hand it back over to the bees, similar to their native host, Apis serrana, the uh, Asian honeybee, who can ha has the mite well under control in their hives. Okay, they've worked out a, a stable host parasite relationship, and that's what we want to have our bees. It's a completely doable thing, and it's, it's happening in nature um, all over the world. The, the, if humans just step out of the picture, the bees will take care of it themselves. That's a natural, the honeybee is not going to go extinct. Now, most people, when your colonies die from Varroa, you just keep repeating the same mistake over and over again. You buy some more mite candy. That's what most commercial producers um, produce, what we call mite candy. Bees that just make an ideal home for varroa mite. Okay, these bees that just brood up big time and they're bred for color, or they're bred for temperament, or they're bred for honey production, or they're bred for anything but mite resistance. And people just keep buying those bees over and over and over again. Okay, again, mite candy. Look at the Achilles heel of varroa, and that's its rate of reproductive success. How many, in each one of those 17 roughly day reproductive cycles, for every foundress mite that enters a cell, how many mated daughters, mature mated daughters, emerge from that cell? Because they don't get mated, they don't count because they can't reproduce, okay? So how many mature mated daughters? And typically that's usually just about one, okay? The, the, the varroa mite has a very tenuous hold inside the colony. Um, if you look at the, uh, well, um, Eve, Eve, are you here this morning? Okay, Eve, there he is. There's some of uh, his data right, right there, and uh, from Barbara Locke from the uh, Gotland Island uh, experiment, where they, where they just did the bond method, let, did the live or let die. Now, I do not recommend the bond method by any means. I'll talk about a, a mite breeding program you can enter without having to lose a single hive, okay? You don't have to lose a single hive to to breed for varroa resistance because you don't have to punish the worker bees. It's only the queens. It's actually only the genes that you have to punish. You have to punish the genes that don't transmit mite resistance and promote the genes that do. You don't have to kill any bees in the process of, of doing that. But where they have done the, the bond method and allow the bees to just work it out, they, they take this um, proportion of successfully uh, reproducing mother mites down from 75% down to you know, 48%, from 90% down to 58%. It doesn't take a lot of reduction, and then the mites are no longer a problem. 
And where do you find this stock? Now, I can't speak for New Zealand, because I don't, I don't know if you guys have done, anybody done mitochondrial testing uh, of uh, mite matrilines in, the, in any surviving feral populations in New Zealand? That would be a good, very good research project right there. So this is from the US. And as I showed yesterday, oh, let me get this pointer here, where we have this, the C, these sea mite types. These are the Central European. These are the Italian and Carniolan type bees. The uh, M mite types are the far Western Europe, the German black bees, uh, the, the bees in England. The O mite types are the Northern African and Spanish mite types. And then there's the A mite type, which is not here. Those are the Africans. I suggest you really don't want the African bees here. Um, nor in Australia. Any Australians, you do not want the African bees in Australia. I will tell you that right now, because they would love that habitat. Anyway, in our managed bees, the C1 and C11 mitotype account for 64, 63% of all the matrilines there. And despite flooding the environment with millions and millions of packages and swarms and drones from these, com these commercial selected uh, bees every single year, um, I mean, just in our cities, I talk, in, in our small cities, the hobby beekeepers standing, have standing orders of like two to 3,000 packages per year going to the same small town because they're killing two to 3,000 packages of bees. And they call themselves treatment-free beekeepers, and I call them serial killers. They're, if you just keep doing the same thing, killing bees year after year, and then just keep saying, oh, I'm not going to treat, but I'm going to restock with a package from a queen breeder who treats his colony six times a year <laughs> with synthetic mycetes, they're, they're delusional. They're going to think they wait, they put their t-shirt on saying I'm a treatment-free beekeeper and suddenly the bees are going to suddenly turn into supermen because they wear the, the t-shirt. That's not going to happen, guys. Don't, don't delude yourself. Um, but the point here is this 63% of these two matrilines right here drops to, what's that, 4 in 1921, 23% in the wild. They don't survive in the wild. As soon as they get hit by the mites and the things that are out there, they, they die. Whereas all these other matrilines, which are ignored by the breeders, these guys have survived in North America from the 1600s with no help from man whatsoever. A complete unbroken maternal lines. So that's a reservoir of genetics that we should all be thinking about tapping into. And it's going to take you, uh, uh, industry wise shift because the problem is with the drone meetings, you can't just in your own operation do this and, and reproduce queens unless you flood the mating with the drones. Because we can't, it's unlike cattle or chickens or sheep where you can control who mates with whom, it's really difficult with the bees to control who, who mates with whom. So the whole industry is going to have to have to do this. And I can't remember what to get the quote from. I'm not going to, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but it's necessary. Okay? I'm not saying. It's hard work. I'm doing really, really hard work at home right now, working on breeding mite-resistant bees. And we're walking the walk. I don't just talk the talk. I'm walking the walk. Here we are. Here's my two sons. They're uh, taking over the operation right here. Very successful. We do just fine. We make a living. We support three families and some labor now um, off our operation. Sell a ton of bees every spring. Don't use any synthetic miticides at all. We have clean honey. We got a premium for our honey. We got a premium for our beeswax. We can put our bees on, on um, people's land who are organic farmers and they don't worry about us you know, causing their loss of organic certification. It can be done. Whoops. Oh, I never finished that sentence. <laughs> well, any change seems impossible to everybody just doing it. Everybody will always say, that's impossible. That's, that's the, always the gut reaction to any change. Oh, that, that's impossible. And then three years later, everybody's doing it. You never think about that you've all achieved the impossible. That's just normal. Here's my website. Lots of information on it. And OK, that's all into the slideshow. If we have time, I'll take questions. <laughs> Did I finish early? Wow. <laughs> I speak in like the state of Georgia and the South where they talk real slow. They say, Randy, you can't talk that fast in Georgia. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. Um, can you please explain um, how 
oxalic vapor works on the mites and on the bees uh, as opposed to the oxalic dribble? Like I would, the actual... I would love to do that. Unfortunately, there is no human being on the planet who can, with any certainty, answer that question. Okay? One of the best things to do is find out if anybody knows what they're talking about. Ask them a tough question. If they say, I cannot give you the answer, you can maybe trust that person. If the, everybody has always had an answer, what we say in the United States, if you want to get a definitive answer to any beekeeping question, always ask a second-year beekeeper because they're at the peak of their confidence for their whole career right then. They can answer any question you want, okay? After you've kept bees for long enough or done enough research, the number of answers you can answer definitively drops. Yeah. Yes, Randy, thank you for that. Um, your comment and your second last slide, it's going to take major industry buy-in to shift the genetics of the breeding population. Yes. I must say that uh, you rang a very large bell for me on that one. I'm a, a, a director of a company that we have set up here called Better Bees, uh -huh. which is trying to uh, do something about genetics. We've got a very close involvement with a well-known genetics department in, in Otago University, uh, Dr. Peter de Dearden, uh, or Professor Peter Dedden, mm -hmm. and um, we're fortunate to have that, but do you think we can get uh, government interested in providing support for research projects to get, to get on with the genetics of bees? How do you go about doing that? Why, why does government have to do it? Why don't beekeepers do it? Well, that's, that's another, I'm pleased you said that because I didn't want to ask that question, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants the government, the government can't do anything. All the government do is borrow money and pass it on to your kids. That's the only thing the government can do. The only people who pay for anything are the people who are working. So if you beekeepers are making a fortune right now, beekeeping right now, I'm told my sons we should move to New Zealand right now, kick, kick everybody's butt and make a fortune and then go back home. But uh, <laughs> um, you guys are making a ton of money. There's no reason you have to ask the government or anybody else to do something. They're just gonna put you more into debt, okay? Do it yourself. <laughs> and the, the, other, the other thing I, I will show you tomorrow afternoon how anybody can get involved in a mite breeding program. Because even if you buy, if you produce, hey, where are you, right here, right there. Even if you release totally mite resistant queens, if the beekeepers don't keep that selective pressure on, you can lose that resistance. So what you need to do is everybody has to get into this monitoring program to make sure you keep eliminating those bees that allow the mice to build up. And then after enough generations, then you can sh shift the genome of the entire population. But until you shift the genome of the entire population, and it doesn't have to all just be one one strain of bees, but once all the bees on the country are all mite resistant, then Roa was, was, was no longer a problem. And that's, that's what you can do, and that's what I'm pushing very hard in the U.S. I've got some of the big commercial breeders um, seriously interested now, and what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'll show it tomorrow afternoon, the exact cost, how many dollars it costs to do it. It is really, really cheap to enter into a strong mite resistance breeding program, and you don't have to lose any colonies. Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm interested in the induced broodless period mm -hmm. because when we're doing our trees for bees research, we find that some beekeepers say we want to have plants planted to cover June and July, which is our winter. Mm -hmm. And then other beekeepers say, uh-uh, I want my bees to rest. I don't want them to have that period. So is it true what you said yesterday um, that the, well, of course it's true, but I just want to find out if you can add to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said that the pollen is what drives the, the broodless up. period. Now, if that's true, trees for bees should be having a policy of don't plant June, July flowering plants. It all depends. So like when I'm speaking about, um, if I speak to a commercial beekeeper group and a, or a hobby group, it's different. Commercial beekeepers all move their bees to Ammons, and we have to have big, strong colonies a month and a half after the winter solstice, okay? Which means they need pollen early in the spring to build up. If you're a hobby beekeeper and you're not going to almond pollination, that's the last thing you want. You don't want your colonies to build up during the winter. You want to suppress varroa reduction as long as you can, then start them building up in time for your honey flow. So the answer is, are you asking an almond pollinator? Are you asking a, a, another beekeeper? We tailor to whoever the person is that is wanting to plant the bees, but I'm just wondering, is it really only just pollen? Yes, yeah, wow. yeah. Okay. The, you know, as long as they have a honey reserve, they are totally, they, they get triggered by the input of fresh pollen, okay? The nectar, nectar helps to stimulate them, but it's really the pollen. Yeah. Um, yesterday when coming here, we were talk my partner and I were talking about what we as little hobby backyard beekeepers could do, you know, with this breeding program. Of uh -huh. course, we feel a bit, you know, small, 
Um, but picking up on what the gentleman just said uh, and you know, putting money forward, so I invite people to maybe think about crowdfunding within the apiary industry, because we would love to, you know, put two, three hundred dollars towards something like that, and possibly even, you know, down the line, get a few good queen e bees. Even better, convince all the hobby beekeepers to buy bees from them. <laughs> the buy might resistant bees. Well, I'm not trying to promote any particular person, but if you can demonstrate in a controlled trial that your bees are indeed resistant to varroa mite, the way to make them successful in the real world is to buy their product. That's the reward. You don't have to have the government. You don't have to have crowd, crowdfunding. You simply do it. Let me give you an example. In, in California, we had uh, Starbucks coffee, and we had uh, the, our, a lot of dairies in California. The dairies were using recombinant uh, somatic, uh, bovine somatotrophic growth hormone for the cattle to increase the milk production. Many people thought that was cruel to the cattle to, to make them be such big producers, and we're pushing against that, trying to get back to just you know, milk that did not have the BS, RBST in it. We didn't make any progress at all. And then Starbucks Coffee, some of their upscale clientele said, hey, is this half and half that goes into our coffee? Is that RSB, RBST half and half, or is that non-RSB uh, tea? a half and half. And Starbucks says, well, let's see, we just sold coffee for $4. We're spending two cents for the half and half. We don't give a shit if we pay an extra tenth of a cent for non-RBST. So they told their dairy producers, oh, we would like our non-RSBT half and half. The dairy producers go, holy crap. Starbucks is a big client. And it's too hard to have two different streams of half and half. So we're just going to tell all of our dairy farmers, we want all of our half and half now, from now on, be non-RBST. Well, the dairy farmers, not just half and half, but for milk and cheese then, they said, well, we can't have two streams of cattle. We'll just shift everything. And in one year, consumer demand from a handful of wealthy people upon Starbucks shifted the entire dairy industry. No government regulation involved at all. Nothing but voting with your pocketbook. You guys have tremendous power as consumers. You can change everything. You can, with your pocketbook, you can vote out governments, you can you get regulations, or you can eliminate regulations, you can change, favor certain industries. Understand your power, vote with your pocketbook. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Hi, Randy. Uh, one of your slides you had uh, with your, uh, your hive monitoring, you had, uh, I'm not sure what you called it, uh, bombs uh -huh. appearing. How did, I'm guessing what you did was you monitored, you found the ones that were showing the high mite counts, uh -huh. and then you requeened them, is that, is that correct? Or well, what, I, what I was trying to show there is that those colonies are gonna collapse. Yep. And as they, as they collapse, the mites shift from the nurse bees to the older bees, and they drift out of the hives, and they drift to the other hives, and then when they finally collapse, and the other hives rob them, when the robber bees come to the hive, the mites recognize them as a bee from a different, different colony, and they hop off the bee that they're on, and they hop onto the stranger, and they catch a ride back to the healthy hives, carrying the virus that killed their hive. Yep. So that's what the mite bombs are. And the and, and they, um, recent data from Dennis Van Engeldorp, for at least two miles in every direction, when they have marked bees in, in the mite bomb, high mite colonies, those same bees show up in hives for two miles in every direction. Okay, so, so what do you do with those hives once oh, you... Oh, well, that's up, that's up to you. What, what we do is we use formic, we kill the queen, we use formic acid, blast all the mites out, and requeen re them. But okay. that would be up, up to you what you did with them. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have another thing. We have a guy who just sat down on top of us <laughs> after a few warnings, and I told my son, hey, next time you see Gary, say, hey, Gary, you know, we, we thought we'd be polite let you know we just established a new sick yard for all our high mite colonies, and it just happened to be across the street from you where you sat down. Just thought you might want to know because we're being polite. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Randy. Can everyone please acknowledge Randy?